All right, shall we uh, begin with the refuges and precepts? All right, so I'll, um, to, together we can just, uh, you know, bow our heads, we've got the Buddha here, uh, three, three bows, um, and it can be, you know, to the Buddha within our, within our hearts too, the, the uh, awakening capacity that we have in this world because the teachings are alive and present here. I'll recite Namo Tassa three times. And then let's see, I wonder if um, someone, and Tia, would you like someone else to do it since you might have to step away um, to unmute themselves and be the voice that's coming back? Um, if we do uh, Sylvia, then we get two voices for the, for the um, volume of one, if, if you're willing to, no? Okay, Dave, are you, are you up for that? Okay, Dave, you're, you're on. So I'll recite Namo Tassa three times, and then whether you're muted or not, recite Namo Tassa three times, um, and then we'll move on to the precepts, or excuse me, the refuges, I'll do them one at a time, call and response, and then the precepts. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namu Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namu Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arehato Sama Sambudasa Bhutang Saranangachami Repeat Bhutang Saranangachami Tamang Saranang Chami Tamang Saranang Chami Sanghang Saranang Chami Sanghang Saranang Chami Duty Ampi Putang Saranang Chami Sutiyam pi buddham dham dhammang saranang chami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranang chami. Dutiyam pi sangang saranang chami. Dutiyampi sankhang saranangachami. Dutiyampi sankhang saranangachami. Tatiyampi putang saranangachami. Tatiyam pi budang saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi tamang saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi tamang saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi sankhang saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi sankhang saranangga chami. Sadhu. It's, it's a blessing Sadhu. that we do get to do these three <laughs> times because 
you know, sometimes it takes that to get, to get us into yeah. the practice of it. So thank you so much for, for mm -hmm. participating. Let's do the precepts as well and call and respond. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. Mm. These are the five precepts, and we also, also had the three refuges. Now, this is a basis for our practice, and it's wonderful that we can recite them together. Thank you. And we're going to be talking today about, uh, you know, embracing feedback from, from others and also from ourselves. And in preparation for that, that's what I feel like uh, having a, a time of meditation together is really valuable because it sets us into kind of a resonance, even just a resonance within our own system that allows us to be grounded in the practice as we are able to interact with what comes at us in the world. So let's start maybe taking a breath or two all the way down to our sits bones to where we're contacting with our chairs, or cushions. Really feeling that support, really feeling that contact. You're invited also to feel the length of the spine, maybe pulling up from the top of the head just a little bit and then letting it kind of relax and settle in a very supported way, using the back of your chair or just the cushion underneath your buttocks. And choose to have your eyes closed or softly open. And if you ever have need, you can open them completely and, and look around your space and just connect through the eyes with the space that you're occupying now. And then when comfortable, return to the body itself. This body is truly our place of practice. It's the place we reach out to everything in the world and it contains so much right within it. It's the mechanism by which we interact with each other. So this is our opportunity to really Concentrate our attention on the body itself. What the sensations are. What those sensations bring up in the mind.
You're welcome to undertake whatever meditation practice is nourishing for you to settle and be present in the body. And at some point, if you wish, you can open to the invitation to be with the body as a whole. Kind of an open awareness of the space the body takes up. the vibrations within the body, how certain parts call your attention. And then you can be choiceful in listening to, for example, the knee feels like this right now. And then reopening to the open awareness of the body as a whole. And then maybe noticing the belly feels like this now. This can be a more active practice that <laughs> for those of us who have just come from lunch may find supportive. And whatever method you choose, I invite you to do it with a gentle curiosity. Now, how is the body right now? Accepting how the body is right now. Loving the body's capacity to do what bodies do and be our teacher. gentle curiosity. And for most of this sit, I will be silent with you. And let your own practice direct you paying attention to the body as it is right now. With that invitation for a gentle curiosity.
whatever form of meditation you're doing, can you notice the quality of your attention? Is it gently curious? Is it softly attentive? Can those qualities be brought to bear? Noticing how things are right now.
as we approach the last five minutes of meditation. Noticing if the Brahma Viharas, the qualities of friendly, loving kindness, compassionate care, joy, appreciation, and balance. If, although they're not the subject, the object of meditation, are the qualities present in how we're attending to meditation. And if they are, if you feel that friendliness, that care, a resonant joy, a balance. Give it some attention, the quality of meeting things as they are. With this expansive heart. And if you find they're not present, consider inviting them in. Consider recalling what it feels like to meet this moment with friendliness, with balance. Hold this moment with care and resonant joy. And see in these last few moments if that changes or enhances this meditation in any way.
Mm. We still have a nice small group. Uh, means there's space for any comments on this meditation practice. Is there anything that came up for you in practicing in this way? Unmute yourself if you can. Dave. I would just say that it that it felt lovely, just very calming, and um, um, I just felt very centered and 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 connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I do find this practice is something that helps condition me you know, to set the tone for how I meet all that's going on you know, when I'm using the body as the, the, the place of practice. And then working from here helps me to you know, kind of hold that centering as I meet other, other bodies out there in the world. Any other comments or sharings? Good afternoon. My name is Gina. Hi, everybody. Nice seeing you here. Good. Nice sharing with you. I wanted to tell you, um, Aya, that um, I'd, I'd like to hear what you think of this. When I meditate, especially nowadays, um, I find it very, very hard to keep my mind in my body. Um, there's a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. um, inside and my mind drifts all the time. Mm -hmm. And I keep coming back and coming back, but still um, the anxiety doesn't subside easy, easily, mm -hmm. um, no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think, uh, I think a lot. Uh, I would go to how do I feel? Um, how do I feel when that's happening to me? Because it definitely does. <laughs> uh, yeah, when I'm, I'm in practice, and the sensations of anxiety seem to be in the forefront if my, you know, my attention is, uh, for me, that, that can manifest in a num number of ways, this um, kind of jangly, tight, you know, kind of vibratory, um, like the body just wants to get out of here type of, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's one. And I notice that if I'm kind of with or, or, or in the belly, it'll start to feel like it's going sour, sour and tight and, you know, maybe a little nauseous. Um, and these are unpleasant. These are unpleasant sensations. And, you know, our, our conditioning just, just by the nature of having bodies, uh, but also our society, we don't like to hang out with the unpleasant. So of course the mind is going to go try to do something else. You know, so I start there. I start with, oh, of course, sweetheart. You know, that distraction that, that, that's, being, that's pulling, you're doing that because you care. You know, because you, you want comfort. And it's kind of a tried and true mechanism to distract ourselves for a little bit moves us away from this unpleasantness. So starting with that, that gentle curiosity of, oh, well, that leaving, that leaving is happening also out of conditioning. I'm curious, I'm curious, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to leave, I'm wanting to think. Now think about solving, whatever might be behind why I'm anxious, or just think about anything to not be in the body. So th these are things that come up for me. Is that first, am I in the ballpark? Or does it resonate? Very much. Okay. 
All right. So we're we're kind of in that same human aspect of dealing with this, this anxiety sensation and the fact that we habitually don't want to be there and so we'll do anything else. But we've kind of committed to staying on this cushion for this amount of time and at least nobody really notices if I space out or go solve something. You know, so at least maybe I'm not disturbing other people. You know, I, I can rationalize. But when I try to, to, to notice like, oh, there you go again. Okay, sweetheart, there you go. What about this is permanent? You know, is there a permanentness in this sensation of, anxiety, the, the vibrations, the tension, the souring, is there a permanentness in this? And be kind of just curious, like, oh, is it always like that? And I can see you shaking your head. No, it's not always like that. So right there, that can give me a little relief. You know, just noticing. No, it's not always like that. Okay, so that's the impermanent. Um, door uh, and then I might apply the dukkha door you know it's like is this pleasant is this unpleasant well it's unpleasant is everything in this body unpleasant right now no no um okay you know what it's not all like that it's not like that all the time so but it it is unpleasant and I can just acknowledge having a body with anxiety in it is unpleasant. And that also can help loosen it for me. It's just like, it's like this. Can I be okay with this? And if I can ask the question of myself, can I be okay with this? I've got enough bandwidth to be okay with it because I'm already, you know, you, you can't you can't come into that curiosity without already kind of being okay enough. And so it's like giving myself credit. Oh, sweetheart, good girl, good girl, or, 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 or good, good little one, good boy, whatever, you know, whatever term you want to put on it. You know, it's like, yeah, you're still here. You know, and then the not self. Um, yeah, that this, for me, I, I work with anxiety a lot. These sensations are conditioned. They're conditioned because I have a body. They're conditioned because I have a mind. They're conditioned because of how I was conditioned growing up, how I was conditioned as I uh, navigated the world, how I was conditioned as I looked back and judged myself. You know, all of these things conditioned me into these sensations right now. And you know, I might be able to tend to them and do something about them, but just the fact that it's, it's not my fault, it's not, you know, it is the causes and conditions that are manifesting. And I can take responsibility for continuing that pattern, continuing that habit pattern, but I also do it with a curiosity and a gentleness. It's like, oh yeah, we've been doing this for a long time because the conditioning has been doing this for a long time. And it's not really me, I'm just kind of caught up in it. Or I, you know, this is just caught up in it. And that also helps it soften for me that it's like, it's like this, it's not me. And I can take a breath and just be with it and be curious with it. So if I'm gonna do thinking to distract myself, from the sensations, I try to do it in a way that I'm actually directing it back, directing it back. So I did a whole lot of thinking there, which is what I wanted to do, but it helped me be present with that as well. And after a while, it's like, okay, well, maybe I'll just try to be with it again and try that for a while until the mind starts to go off and go, oh, sweetheart, there you go. Yeah. How's that land? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, uh, yes, 
it's very comprehensive what you just told me it's it's deep and it's wide and uh, thank you i think it it helps a lot i'm gonna it, because exactly what you're saying is um uh, it it seems like a like a way of not quitting of the anxiety not like just closing my eyes to it and but 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 trying really to just learn to 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 be to live with that uh, for the time it, it it's here with me and um not be so maybe judgmental about it and and afraid of it more, more than anything afraid of it uh, afraid of the fact that it seems not to disappear now as it used to before mm -hmm. and it seems to be you know continually with me but what you're saying about giving it it's like giving it space and 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 just trying to relax with it that seems like a very good recipe thank you so much thank you yeah. Do you know what you're saying that give it space and relax with it is, is lovely. Um, and, and I want to acknowledge that, you know, I'm, I'm here in robes with a shaved head and I've been, you know, practicing for a little while and I am actually quite sure that there are others on this call who have been practicing as long or probably longer than I have. So there's probably a lot of wisdom here. And is there anyone else that would like to comment on these things, the, the calmness or, or what to do when the agitation arises? I'll, uh, I'll share my tips and tricks about anxiety. I, I, um, I, uh, I also have felt the increase particularly in the last uh, two years, the pandemic has, uh, impacted my anxiety a lot and I love I love the idea of the can I be with this now because uh, I also curiosity helps me disengage with either uh, feeling stuck in it or uh, what can be even more challenging sometimes is the loop of I'm anxious, I'm concerned about being anxious or scared of being anxious or something about being anxious, which makes my anxiety more intense, like the loop that intensifies it. And any question, embodiment, uh, 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 look around the room and pick five blue things, anything that I can do that disrupts that cycle or reminds me that I am in fact not stuck is phenomenal. So the, can I do this now? And you know what, if the answer is no, then I'm gonna go lie down for five minutes. Like what's my, what am I, what am I going to do, right? Doing something often does that. And sometimes it's a mental, like what can I be curious about? Uh, uh, when can I remember that it wasn't like this? Those, those are all super phenomenal for me over the last while uh, to, to step off this, the little the hamster wheel. Yeah. I'll add on that embodiment piece and then we'll, we'll come to, to Sylvia. Um, the, with the embodiment, yes, there's that orienting practice of opening the eyes and looking around the room and it can be finding five blue things. It can be just noticing the corners of the room you know, getting back in space. And then we can also, it start just being in, noticing the room also starts to, make, especially if I turn my body a little bit to do it, it, it starts to bring me back into the body. And then I can intentionally kind of titrate, you know, go in a little bit, go out a little bit, go in a little bit, go out a little bit, back into to this. I'm, I'm in this space there is a certain amount of safety in this space. And now what's it like here? Let's pass it to uh, Sylvia. Okay. Um, I get anxious when I'm sometimes in bed and I, I cannot go to sleep. So uh, then I start getting very upset and 
nothing that I do helps to calm down. And then what you say, which is like a little bit funny, my sweetheart be, and I, th I think that I do that while I'm trying to sleep or to relax. Mm -hmm. So I put myself in complete uh, savatsana and rela mm -hmm. relax totally. Mm -hmm. And if in, a, in an hour I'm not asleep, I get up, I get very nervous. And I say, it's not worthwhile. Why should you, I mean, you sleep well usually, so don't complain. And that helps a lot. Not, I, I'm a big complainer. I remember uh, my father saying, ah, oh, she complains. She knows how to complain. <laughs> and then I say, oh, you know what? Life is not always easy. Life is not always the best one would want for oneself, but it's good enough. I mean, we're here, we are reading, we are watching the, the trees, the birds, my doggy, my beloved Gina. I, 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 so, sometimes I'm so grateful, so I should be more grateful and maybe, maybe less anxious. <laughs> Or, or grateful that, that anxiety is here as the teacher at this moment. Um, not grateful to remove the anxiety, just grateful that you've got the practice to be with it. And that practice might include lying in Savasana, or it might include getting up. It might include giving that you know, care to, to yourself in that moment. Um, but the gratitude is, is not a, a moving away it's an embracing and it really helps that curiosity to stay alive and gently present. Um, so I just offered that as just a slight tweak on what you said, because what you were saying was so beautiful and responsive to, you know, what's present in you. Okay. Well, shall we move into the, the theme for today? I think this is a really good foundation for that. And having a small group is is wonderful because, um, like I said, you know, I'm I'm in robes, but I'm I'm still pretty uh, pretty young in robes. Um, so um, there's uh, uh, this topic is is rich for me. <laughs> this topic of of needing to embrace admonishment and are, is everyone familiar with that word admonishment? It's it's. Uh, receiving like corrections, you usually with the intention of good. It's, you know, when we, when we say admonish, it's not just criticism to be critical. It's usually to make uh, a positive change, to point out something because uh, we're good spiritual friends. And so it's something that I'm working with. And I would highly doubt that any of you have made it this far without having encountered some admonishment in your life. So um, also with the, the sense that there is some collective wisdom here, please feel free to uh, insert your wisdom, that this not just be a talk, that this be a Dhamma exploration that we do together. Okay, so I'll start. And I'll, I'll start with a homage to, to the Buddha, just that th this is where the teachings come from. This is the gratitude that, you know, I want to express that um, this has come down to us. Namo tasa bhaguato harahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhaguato Arahato Samha Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambhutasa Gudang Tamang Sangam Namasami So 
I feel like the Buddha's teachings can really be our, our GPS system. Uh, how, how to stay on the path. And maybe you know that uh, probably all of us, while driving, we've used one of those GPS uh, apps or map applications to, to keep us on, on course. And when you've deviated from the course, it will, it will say, um, take a U-turn. <laughs> or it will send you around the block to try and get you pointed back in the right direction. Well, I feel like Kalyanamita, our spiritual friends, that, that, that's, that's our GPS. And they can help us also to stay on that path. And they can alert us when we're deviating from the course that's you know, leading in the direction that we've, we've committed to when we, as we took the uh, refuges and precepts earlier, you know, that, that course. So there's a real strength in having groups like this, uh, living with, living in community or near community, having online community that can help give us feedback when we need to take a U-turn or go around the block. So I'm gonna to bring together several of the Buddha's teachings uh, and, I, and I found kind of one flow for the course correction that's uh, got potential for an easeful way to that, that calm, curious way of working with it. It's not a you know, strong and rigid way. It's, it, it's, it's something I found, um, I found can, can, I can do in an embodied way that, uh, because I do work a lot with anxiety, that 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 agitation has space and it, it doesn't cut me off from receiving correction. So I've come up with these three parts. We're going to set up to be able to receive correction. We're going to set the conditions so that we're primed to receive correction. And then the act of receiving the correction or the feedback, you know, the admonishment, or uh, find find the words that work for you. Some of some of those words can be triggering. Find the word that can be the most um, held for you that you'll get value out of it. And then the third would be uh, how we respond to a correction or a, a feedback and admonishment. And I realize that that what actually happens in the world often has two parts. Receiving unsolicited criticism and then reacting. So we're trying to go with um, more of the Buddha's teaching that gives us this package of, of setting up for correction, receiving it, and then responding to it. So I have, I have a deep interest in how we can not just go with the social norms uh, but that we can begin to, to meet them and change them and uh, relate from a more tender place that's going to actually lead, um, lead to liberation. So let's first focus on, let's see, uh, why? Maybe setting it up, we might, we might want to know why do we want to receive admonishment it's it's admonishment typically is painful you know usually if we're getting correction or criticism or feedback uh what happens in the body uh you know there's a guarding so knowing that there's a value in it will begin to help us to open up to it um Believing that it's useful, aligning our intention and inviting feedback. So that's where, where we're going. Believe it. So on the on the it's useful. Anguttara Nikaya 734 says, one with good friends, easy to admonish, reverential and respectful. Such a one cannot fall away, but is close to Nibbana. 
So that's a pretty high statement for uh, why it would be useful to be easy to admonish, to be open to, to receiving feedback. It brings us that we're not gonna fall away from this path and it brings us closer to Nibbana. And then um, this, I love this story in Anguttara 3, 128. So this is the Buddha who's giving, who's gonna give the feedback in this one. And he, he sees a bhikkhu as he goes out on his alms round. He sees the, this bhikkhu who was straying into following craving, you know, becoming muddle-minded and angry. <coughs> so essentially this, he, he, he knows the mind of this, this monastic and he sees uh, the monastic is kind of heading the way of greed, hatred, and delusion. So the, the Buddha gives him a, a fairly strong um, reproach. And we don't need to go into the particulars of that reproach, because uh, as we receive admonishment, it'll be personal to our experience. But what I really value is it says, then the monk admonished with the blessed one's admonishment came to his senses. So that's what uh, the power of, of a good friend giving us good admonishment can be. We can come to our senses because we're, we're, we're deluded um, a lot of the time. And it takes a good friend to be able to help point that out. It's the power of listening to and taking to heart a good correction that we can come to our senses. So before I became a monastic, I was practicing at a common ground meditation center in, in Minnesota. Uh, and Ajahn Jyoti Palo, who's uh, a bhikkhu from the Thai forest tradition, he was a, a visiting monastic to the center. And he told a story of when he was visiting another monastery and he wasn't familiar with their, you know, uh, how, how they did things, what, what the rules were. It's not so much necessarily about ethics, but just about how do you do things at a particular monastery, uh, which we encounter in life all the time. How do you do things in these settings? So if you start a new job, you got to learn the policies and procedures. Uh, if you're uh, diversifying your community experience, you, you kind of have to see what, what is appropriate, what's right. And so he said that he was, uh, they have these seats for the monastics uh, to sit on um, that are kind of raised. And he was sitting at the edge of one of these seats with his feet dangling over the edge, which I guess is a no-no in this monastery. And the monastic came up to him and, and said, Ajahn, you know, we don't do that. We, it, it isn't proper to have your feet hanging off the platform. Uh, you should sit cross-legged or you should get off and stand. And Ajahn Jyoti Palo, uh, his response was to put his hands in a respectful position, Anjali, and say, thank you, venerable. Please, if you see me doing anything else, please let me know. What an incredible response. So thank you, venerable. This is how he responded to this feedback. If you see me doing anything else, please let me know. <laughs> he went on and he said, you know, that word got around. <laughs> and so he got feedback from all of the local monastics for several days. And he had to practice with the quality, you know, pulling up the qualities of patience and respectfulness to be able to meet this. But he kept getting this feedback. No, 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 we don't wash our bowls that way. No, 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 no. We walk in a line this way. Oh, Ajahn, your, your robe is a little off. You know, all of these little details about what is the social etiquette for that particular place. Now we're not talking morality here. We're just talking getting along in the culture. And he said it was a little, little rough and you really had to practice with that patience and respectfulness. But at the end of just a few days, within a week, he was fully in the flow of that community. Now, 
he he was really he, he wasn't still looking around he said he there were other monastics who were, who started their visit about the same time who were still doing the where should i stand you know uh, is this is this the right time am i supposed to go there now which you know we all do in different social situations but he was quickly past that because he was so open to receiving that information about what would be appropriate so I offer that as, you know, if we can do that with these simple social norms of, 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 of interaction, it really helps open us up for when the big things happen, where we're actually deviating from a path of, of practice that's leading to liberation, where, we're, where our eightfold path is, is here and we've kind of, you know, stepped off a little bit. So starting with that, you know, my dear friends, thank you for what, you, what you've told me about this. Um, I wasn't on time or whatever, the little, the little detail is I, I neglected that email. You know, um, I really appreciate that feedback. Please, if you see anything else, let me know. In monastic life, we also have this uh, at least once a year because there, there's a time period where we're with a group for three months typically. So at least at the end of that time, but here, because we live in community all year, we have this open invitation. And that invitation is anything you have seen, heard, or suspected me of doing that deviates from my ethical conduct, that deviates from uh, right alignment with the path, please, I am open for you to tell me what you've seen, heard, or even suspected so that I can be clear about that. Because I know that I'm practicing with some delusion. And also if you've seen something and I've been trying to cover it up, it's really for my benefit to be called into conversation about that. And that's a, a basic premise of how we work in community. And I know this is not how the world works in giving feedback. Oh, this, that openness is generally not a social norm. And so I, I know I'm looking at it in kind of a rarefied environment but I'm really curious about how we can start to grow that in our relationships. So how we can start to be open and intimate and vulnerable and that it can be safe to do so even in the wider world. And we can start to, to talk about that as a group. Um, one of the things is the, oh, let's see, I've only covered, I've only covered the receiving, let's see, asking for the, the feedback and the, um, let's see, the setting up, um, the usefulness of it. We also need to, to look at um, the, the process, how we, how we go about setting up the conditions here because if the conditions here are just that vibrating of anxiety and fear and anger and judgment and and you know if that is the mantle we're moving in the world with and then we're met with a um, you didn't do that correctly we're probably not conditioned to oh thank you venerable <laughs> please, please share with me what else you see. That's probably not the words that are going to come out. So I'm going to just back up to what the Buddha shared with his own son, Rahula, to cultivate moral introspection, you know, that, that looking inwards, what I was calling that curiosity, that gentle curiosity. So cultivating this introspection about our own morality, our ethics, how we are showing up. And the Buddha said, what do you think, Rahula? What is the purpose of a mirror? 
or for the purpose of reflection, Dante. So too, Rahula, an action with the body should be done after repeated reflection. An action by speech should be done after repeated reflection. An action by mind should be done after repeated reflection. Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? And when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction or the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you definitely should not do such an action with the body. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results then you may do such an action with the body. And he goes on then to, to repeat that same type of reflection while you're doing the action. And it also repeats it for while you're speaking this thing, while you're thinking this thing, while you're doing it. Also reflect, is this wholesome? Is, is it impacting? So the first one is the intention. And now we're looking at the impact. Is the impact afflictive or helpful. And then he recommends after you've done an action with the body or the speech or the thought, also reflect, use that mirror. So in this way, if we condition ourselves to be in this reflective way with that gentle curiosity, then we can show up because we're looking at what's happening, what's happening, what's happening when I'm doing this, this is what's happening. So then if someone else gives us feedback, we already know how to use the mirror. We can say, oh, right. You know, it felt like this. It felt like this. That didn't feel like a wholesome action. I would like to apologize. I'd like to make amends. So I wanted to open it up at this point where we're at the setting up to receive corrections. And we might have to go into the actual receiving and responding to them uh, at a different time where you can talk amongst yourself whenever you're, you're meeting again. Um, how, how do you set up so that when those corrections come, you're in a space to receive them and to actually put them to that use of, of what was the phrase, uh, coming to our senses. I, I, I could ask a question, but I, I didn't want to mm -hmm. jump in front of, of anyone. Um, uh, well, um, I, I was thinking when you were, when, um, when you were teaching about, um, I was thinking about intention and I, I was thinking about um, uh, um, like holding on to views and, and how, and how um, as far as intention is, I, I, I think that in a situation where I'm, I'm in, um, in a new community or um, uh, among people that I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with that um, what I want is to be in harmony with, with, with that and, and, and to, um, um, to not, uh, to not be bound to, to my, my earlier views. So, um, I think that I, that I do very much want feedback on how I, I can be in harmony with, with community, but I, I also know that I can feel um, agitation with with certain kinds of feedback depending on on how it's presented and mm -hmm. and also my view of the person who's presenting it um, which has a lot to do with with 
with with my ego and you know and I, I was I was also thinking about the value of noble friendship and and that when we do associate ourselves with um with with um um with with wise people or with people with with good and wholesome intentions that um uh, uh feedback given from a, a perspective of um of uh you know from from the perspective of the brahma faharas even if it isn't um even if parts of it are are regrettable that that the intention of it uh as as being something uh helpful um is is easier to take but then i was also thinking uh, um um that all this requires mindfulness and that uh you know i'm 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 studying um I'm studying Satipatthana right now, and in, in, in particular, uh, the third one of mind. And in 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 a class that I'm participating in, we were we were talking about you know checking in with how how is the mind, and 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 how how to how to keep uh, that perspective of 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 being present in, in and 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 perceiving how how the mind is being affected. So I was, was and 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 I'm struggling a little bit with that. Of, you know, being uh, absorbed with, you know, the outside object and also being in, in communication with, with my mind and, and how is, how is my mind? Mm -hmm. Well, Dave, you're, you're, to me, you're really like nailing the spectrum of experience and the, the linchpin for, for meeting it. So you mentioned the intention for harmony, you know, bring, being harmonious in the interaction uh, so you can acknowledge that my initial intention is wholesome. That's the part that Rahula did before he made the act. And then the not holding to our views is what allows us to be present and, and the mindfulness. So the sati and the not holding to the views, the mindfulness not holding to views is allows us in that moment to actually be gauging how is my action landing in the community that I have the intention of being harmonious with. But if we just hold to, well, that wasn't my intention. <laughs> how many times have we said that or heard that? That wasn't my intention. You know, that closes the door to actually being present with, because we're back in our intention. We need to be in that moment and flexible and curious. How is it actually landing when I do this action? And then the same with the reflection. And then in the middle of that, we may get feedback. We may get the feedback of, you know, when you said that, it felt like this and that didn't feel good. And if we notice, oh, I have a view, this person's always complaining. It's like, it doesn't matter what they just said because I'm stuck in my view. But if I can meet it with the curiosity and the, the holding my view lightly, then I have a chance to actually adjust my behavior or my thinking or my view based on that. Oh, you know what? Actually, when I say that, it's not landing the way I intended. And it may be, you know what? I don't know that I have the skills to make it land differently. And it may be that they have a comma, they have a trauma, they have an experience, their conditioning that no matter what I say, it's gonna land on them in a way that I didn't intend. So all of that can be true. And when we're aware of it all possibly being true, it, it opens up the possibility for the correction to land in a way that I can respond in a way that's liberating for me and the person who's giving me the feedback. Is that? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, just and, touching that. Yeah, yeah, it's like the exploration yeah. just beginning. <laughs> it's very subtle. Yeah, Gina. Oops, unmute. I, I want to ask, or maybe I, with all of that that you just said, maybe I just have to 
not try when those are the conditions, maybe it's better not to try to give any correction or, you know, and, and really retreat and wait for the moment when that can happen, even mm -hmm. if my intentions are good. But, and I know all of what you just said, I know it won't land well. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the best thing for me is just to be quiet and not try that now. What do yes. you think of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So a situation that I found myself in, you know, thinking that I'm in a community, and I'm not saying what community it was at the, you know, when this was happening. I was in a community and thinking that we, yes, we'll, we'll wrap up very soon. Thinking that we are on the same page where we're doing mutual corrections for our mutual benefit and realizing that anytime I said something, it was not landing well. And doing, as you say, taking that step back and saying, you know, something about me, them, this is not conducive. It's not liberating right now, but I don't want to lose the benefits of receiving correction. So I am going to do the extra work of putting in those characteristics of being patient and respectful. I'm gonna put in some extra efforts so I don't lose the benefit of receiving correction. And it's much harder when you can't do it mutually. But that way I didn't close the door on my learning. And it also actually uh, now this is in a, in a, in a space where I had enough safety that it wasn't like I was being harmed by, by the correction at that time. I had enough spaciousness to take care and, and to be able to hold that um, correction for my benefit. So I do want to just close with that as a, a, a wrapper. Do look for your safety. Do look that you're resourced enough to meet it. And if you're not, grow that before you jump into receiving and grow it even more before you jump in to the giving of correction. So I've, I've really appreciated our time together in this, this small group. It's, it's lovely to have you know, just some, some intimate conversation space on these, these Dhamma topics. So thank you for sharing with me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you very much.